Hi, everyone. Thank you, Warren. Uh, let me add my welcome to uh, Mayor Walsh. First time he's been with us here at the uh, BCCEO Club Lunch. Uh, and I want to tell you, in speaking to the people of the business community through Greater Boston, Massachusetts, uh, your, your focus on building an innovative economy, an innovation economy in, in Boston is, is right on. Uh, we're right with you, and we'll help you in every way we can. So thank you, Mayor. You know, it's always, I've done this several times, and it's always an honor uh, to be uh, asked to host a, uh, a CEO uh, who's going to spend some time with us and impart his wisdom. Uh, but it really is a special honor for me today because this CEO happens to be a good and close personal friend of mine, somebody I've known for years and somebody that I truly love. He's just a tremendous individual. When I think of three words that capture Bill McDermott, uh, comes to mind passionate, incredibly positive. You spend some time with Bill, you just feel better. And, and he's a winner. And our winning started when he was very young. He probably doesn't want me to tell this story, but I will. Uh, Bill is 17 years old. Now think about this, 17 years old. I only thought about playing baseball at 17. Bill borrowed $5,500 and bought a delicatessen. It's a true story. That delicatessen was immensely successful. You know, Bill went on to college at Dowling College, got his MBA at Kellogg. They went to Xerox, spent 17 years there, became the youngest president uh, in, in Xerox's history of a business unit. Uh, after that, uh, he went to run sales at Siebel. Uh, after that, he went to short stint at Gartner, came over and ran SAP Americas, was co in 2010, became co-CEO of SAP. And uh, as a recognition of his great work, but I'll get a little ahead of myself, on May 1st, he becomes the only CEO of SAP, and he's the first American, or non-German actually, to hold that, hold that post. So he's just, just to give you a little bit of his accomplishments. And by the way, as I stand here today, last year they did over $23 billion in revenues. They have 66,000 employees, and they're, they have 250,000 customers. And Bill, I'm proud to say that EMC is one of those very valued customers, and vice versa, by the way. Uh, so thank you, Bill. And, um, the market cap is approaching $90 billion. So as I said, this is a man of passion, a man of joy, and a winner. And somebody I'm truly, and I mean this truly, glad to count among my very best friends. So without further ado, let me bring up Bill McDermott. Joe, what an introduction. I'd like to begin by thanking my great friend Joe Tucci for hosting me and hosting this luncheon today. I can't tell you how honored I am to be introduced by a man that not only do I love as a friend, but I deeply admire as an executive. I think Barron's had it right when they rated Joe Tucci among the greatest CEOs in the world. I know of no greater CEO than Mr. Joe Tucci. Joe, thank you for being here. In fact, um, my friendship with Joe is really legendary at this point, and it's one of the things that I'm most proud of. In the IT industry, friends are hard to come by. And when you have one, you keep them for life. This uh, weekend, Joe and I hosted the Super Bowl together. I remember being at the 50-yard line of MetLife Stadium, Joe, when we closed the deal with John Mara and Woody Johnson on the MetLife Stadium for EMC and SAP to be partners. And people are like, partners? How could you share a box? Well, we just had one of the greatest days of our life on Sunday. And I must admit, because I think I am among friends here, I'm a tortured Jet fan. <laughs> and, and I know in this environment, it's even more special knowing that I'm a tortured Jet fan. <laughs> And this weekend, of course, you know, you get Peyton Manning out there, and there were talks in all the press about him potentially being the greatest of all time, legendary and so forth, you know. And I sort of studied it after the game to see where the sentiment analysis was going. We have this technology called SAP HANA, which measures things in real time and captures the social sentiment analysis off the web. And there was actually a million hits on the name Peyton Manning, and there was only 100,000 on the name Tom Brady. But what was interesting is as you dug underneath the covers, 
the sentiment analysis on Manning being the greatest versus Brady had swung dramatically after Sunday's game. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, you once again came close with New England, but your great, precious Tom Brady is once again the legend he was born to be, the three-time Super Bowl winning champion quarterback. You know, um, Joe and I, as well as many of you, were recently in Davos, and I focused on two things and really learned a couple of things in Davos. The first was this millennial generation, those individuals born between 1980 and 1993 in particular, I truly believe are the next great generation, and I'd like to comment on that a little bit. And also the idea of disruptive innovation and embracing disruptive innovation. Because I really believe the biggest chance, the biggest risk, is not taking the big chance and the big risk. Because this environment is brutal on people that get left behind on the innovation curve. So let's talk about the millennial generation first. I had the distinct pleasure of hosting millennials from all over the world at Davos. And it was a morning breakfast, very similar to this. And we get in a room, and I'm a, a constant avid learner when it comes to this millennial generation because they're the future. And I'm asking question after question, and somebody from India gets up and says, I have a question for you. Okay. And my question is simple. What was it like for you when you were a millennial? And I'm like, wow, I kind of like that. So I told my story. And Joe introduced the delicatessen today. When I was 16 years old, I traded in three jobs for one full-time business for 5,500 notes. And it was a delicatessen business. And what I learned in that little old delicatessen is the importance of focusing single-mindedly on your customers. Real simple when you have to make payroll. And I also learned that you have to know your base and segment your customer base and be very clear with your value proposition. So, hey, let's face it. My little old delicatessen wasn't going to change the world. But if I could make a difference in people's lives just a little bit each day and they'd come back, I could survive. So I focused on three target markets. One was how do I get the senior citizens to come to my store? Because they were a block and a half down the road in a condominium complex. First lesson, what do we know about senior citizens? They don't want to come to my store or anyone else's. So we deliver. Then there was the idea of the blue collar worker. Guys and ties don't keep little delicatessens in business. So what you learn is they're really rich on Friday night, and they're broke by Saturday morning. <laughs> so we give them credit. You can sign out anything you want in a notebook and build that loyalty with that blue-collar base, and they'll never beat you out of a dime. But the hardest problem I had to solve was, again, the young generation, because there was a 7-Eleven right next door to the high school. And I was a block and a half from the high school, so how do I get these kids to walk past 7-Eleven a block and a half to my store? So this is a, all about your competition, right? What is my competition doing? Well, they got a big store. I got a little store. Why are they lining kids up four at a time and not letting them in the store? Well, I asked the kid, why are they lining you up four at a time and not letting you in the store? Because they think we're going to steal. Oh, wow. That's bad. <coughs> So I went to the mall one day, and I saw these kids plucking quarters in a video game, game uh, room into asteroids and Pac-Man one, one after another. And I knew they were mom and dad's quarters, but I wanted some of them. So I basically went to the, the back of the game. This is like a New York thing, right? The back of the game, the guy's name's on the game. I call the guy, and I say, I'd like to get one of these games in my store. He goes, sure, 5000 I said, I don't have 5,000. All right, 4,000. <laughs> I said, oh, wait a minute. I don't have 4,000 either. But well, what about this? Why don't you just bring the game to my store? We'll just split the quarters at the end of the month, and it'll always be your game. I can go with that. OK, bring over the game. So we get the games in there to draw the kids. Now the kids are coming down to my store, hanging out 40 at a time. And really to underscore customer satisfaction and loyalty, 
one of these young kids came up to me one day and said, real simple, Bill, when we want to get a good meal, be treated with dignity and respect, and play games, we come to your store. And when we want to steal stuff, we go to 7-Eleven. <laughs> So, you know, this idea of the millennial generation and the disruption they cause happened way back then, and it's happening now, too. And when I think about kind of the strategic inflection point of our company and our strategy in 2010, we kind of had to rethink everything. Because we were all about C-level relationships, making it up to the top floor in the corner office. But the world had changed with the consumerization of IT, the ubiquity of mobile devices. After all, this was the only generation born into the mobile. And if they didn't get beautiful technology that was easy to use, they simply went to one of our competitors. So we really had to kind of rethink things and not rest on our laurels about being a leading business software company, but recognize really where the world was going. People were going to consume technology. It had to be easy and beautiful. And it also had to be easy to consume in the sense that they didn't have a lot of time to wait to get the value out of it, which is this whole cloud computing rage. And that was the first big shift in the strategy. And once again, we're at another point in shifting the strategy. And that strategy to me today, as I rethink everything once again four years later, is complexity. I think complexity is the most intractable CEO issue of our time. And I think it's so important that we make things so simple in these enterprises and we collapse complexity. In my business, and Joe knows this well, because EMC and SAP are unbelievable partners, we know the importance of taking these enterprises and simplifying everything so executives can do anything. And this is collapsing things, lowering footprint, delivering things in a more easy, simple way. And let me underscore it with an example of an industry that's near and dear to my heart. I'm on the board of Under Armour. You might know the sports apparel company, Under Armour. And recently we made an acquisition. And the company we bought was all about digitizing the athlete. How do I connect the actual fabric of the company to the digital metrics of the athlete and capture all the biorhythms and give the athlete real-time feedback on how they're doing. In fact, Karen, you'll appreciate this, Future Girl is a vision where Future Girl can swipe her arm and change the colors and the heat and cold intensity of the fabric at the swipe of a finger. And that athlete now can connect their biometrics and their performance to real-time analytics so they know if they're getting better or worse and if they're living up to their true potential. Yesterday I was on the phone with the uh, CEO of one of the sports franchises in the southern part of the United States and his whole idea is essentially giving real-time analytic feedback to the athlete and to the contracts negotiator when they're putting together their contract so the athlete doesn't end up on the injured reserve list, which is now costing the team $100 million a year. So the implications of technology and the impact of technology, the usability of technology on individual performance is going to be a massive, massive scale business. But then I can also take the same argument to the fan experience since we just got over the Super Bowl. And I think about my great friend Jed York, who runs the San Francisco 49ers, and they got a new stadium going up in Santa Clara. In fact, the 2016 Super Bowl will be there. And you're trying to digitize everything so the fan can have an unbelievable experience before they get to the stadium. While they're at the stadium, who wants to wait on lines to get to the restroom? Does anybody? Isn't it odd that you don't have real-time feedback on how short the line should be before you have to get up and leave your cozy seat? that you paid so much money for. Isn't it crazy that you might have had a seat at the 50-yard line for 20 years and nobody even knows who you are? <laughs> Isn't it wild that it's your son or your daughter's birthday and they're not getting a special <laughs> offer right to their digital device in real time? Isn't it crazy that they can't play what-if games and actually put themselves in Tom Brady's shoes as he's playing quarterback and going back for a pass? 
So these avatars will be real, it'll all be on the device, the team will be able to run better, but you create these digital experiences that are amazing. You think about women's tennis, you know, and the idea of Serena being able to see in real time the coefficients of her swing, the speed, the angle, and what she could be doing better with real time dashboards on the side of the tennis court. And it goes on and on and on. So where I'd like to finish is where I began, and let's get into some Q&A. This is an unbelievable time for this next great generation to step up. In SAP, I've told every senior executive that runs a big business, you will not make me happy unless you have a 20-something running a huge part of this corporation. You will not make me happy unless you get deeply involved in universities all over the world and we build the relationships with the next generation to keep the company young, to keep the company ambitious, keep the company humble, and keep the company on a growth trajectory. This is so in front of us, and we have such an opportunity to challenge our leaders to do better with youth and get the young ones in these workplaces and get them winning again. If you look at youth unemployment in places like Spain, 50% youth unemployment. The Middle East has to employ everybody in government because they get, can't get commercial jobs. We can change all that with just a vision for the next great generation, the millennial generation. The second thing on the innovation side, I'm so optimistic because this technology is available now that can truly run your life and your business in real time. And you shouldn't settle for anything less. Those devices on your hip can not only manage your life better, but you can empower your people, empower your customers and your suppliers to completely rethink how you run and how you innovate and change business models and win. So for all that and more, I'm grateful to my friend Joe Tucci for having me today. I'm grateful for your time and attention. And I'd love to mix it up here a little bit and answer some questions. And I would have gladly tipped my hat to the mayor as well, Joe, but he had to go. But if you could, on my behalf, congratulate him on his great election win. It's awesome for the city of Boston. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, and let's do some Q&A. Thank you. So the question is, you know, how is it competing against Larry Ellison, Oracle, and how is your philosophy different? One of the things we really tried to do with our vision and our strategy for the company was to make the world run better and improve people's lives. So we thought if we focused on the customer and were uniquely advantaged in 25 distinctly different industries and we made companies run better, we could actually outpace anybody. And I think what we've tried to do with Oracle is basically point out that the disk-based database system, where they make almost all their money, is yesterday's technology. And you can't fight tomorrow's war with yesterday's technology. So we've tried to take our customers to real-time in-memory computing with SAP HANA. We tried to establish a real foothold in the cloud with more users than any company in the world in the cloud now, 35 million. And we really tried to accentuate the power of mobility and the ubiquity of mobility in the hands of the business consumer. Not saying better, the customer decides, but certainly a different strategy than Oracle's. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. So the question is, how does SAP make the millennials interested in SAP? First is, you have to have alliances at the university level. So we have 600 really deep global university alliances now with the best universities in the world. So that's one thing. You've got to meet them early on. I actually think we need to do better, and we need to get into the high schools. We also need to consumerize the brand. Our brand has been very much a B2B brand. So the people with big business cards like all of you know who we are, but we need the consumer to know who we are. So, for example, when you download the iTunes 
today before you take your flight. It'd be nice if somehow SAP could have let you know that if you enjoyed that experience, it was all run by SAP. And therefore, you kind of bridge the gap into the consumer. When you go to the sports game, you know, thanks to the good work I've done with Joe, you know, you can now see the SAP brand front and center in these sports stadiums, and people are going to start experiencing things on their device. And the millennials, when we did the deal with the NFL, the um, Major League Baseball, and many of the other professional sports leagues around the world, you go to NBA today, they're running 20 million consumers a month on NBA.com on SAP software. They never knew that before. So we're working hard on being a business-to-business-to-consumer company. And that's a shift we have to make. But the other thing is, we're going to hire some people this year. We'll probably, after you have natural retirement and attrition, we'll probably hire seven or 8,000 people this year. We need to have at least 35% of those be millennial generation people. And then finally, you know, I'm the first one to admit, I think Google's a cool company. I think Facebook's a cool company. I think Twitter's a nice company. But I also think there's something to be said for, you know, a company that has that consistent core and that can innovate on the edges. And that's what we're trying to do at SAP. And so far, it's resonating. You know, we'll hire about 1,100 millennials for sure this year. One other thing, you know, there's a, another great university in Boston, like tonight, we gave them a case study, and uh, we said, here's our strategy. You know, put holes in our strategy, and let's do a lightning round tonight at 7 o'clock with all millennial generation people. And I think that, like, you know, breaks down the walls between you and the next generation where they can actually take a look at the strategy and give their insight and be a part of it. You know, they just want to be included in the, in the debate. I think. Yeah, oh yeah, and then there's another thing too. There's other, the other thing with the millennials is we started this whole idea of basically moving people out on sabbaticals. So what we learned in our trials and errors, and we've made our share of mistakes, is that the millennial generation cares less about promotions and raises than they do purpose. So we basically created a global sabbatical program for the millennials. There's this woman, Benita Lim, and Nuomi Springs in Shanghai, and basically she retails things, but she only hires uh, young women who were either, you know, severely disadvantaged or actually prostituted on the streets. And she brings them in, she rehabilitates them, and she gives them great opportunities. By having a platform strategy with Bonita and helping her now move out into Europe and expand her business, she only hires young women. So this, again, is another way of not only getting our people engaged in the mix, but also changing the perception of the brand, where now people can see us getting behind causes that stand for high purpose. Yes, sir. You know, as I uh, look over your industry, which I have not been directly involved in, I watch the, uh, and watch the evolution. One of the unique facets, which is you just don't see it in other businesses, is what I would call a time bomb. Is, which is the hackers and the security and so forth. And it almost seems like it's, they're all, all right behind you, sometimes getting ahead. What, what, what's the future of that? Well, Joe could, you know, give a, a complete lecture on this topic. We were in Davos together, and I actually saw him give a great talk in front of uh, Bill Gates and a whole bunch of CEOs from the technology industry from all over the world. It's a race without a finish line. Um, the one thing that, you know, we have learned is this Snowden situation has raised and heightened the awareness of security um, to a completely different level. And if you go, not just in the United States, but especially if you go to Europe or places like Germany, there is just a tremendous concern around security. So I think companies that have great solutions like EMC, uh, VMware, and uh, hopefully as well SAP, you know, we try to provide security and secure clouds in particular as our way of saying, put your business and your risk in the hands of the best ones because security and the way you manage those customer relationships are going to be so important. But what I also see is a very difficult situation in getting people to agree on global clouds where they're much more interested now in the European cloud or the U.S. cloud or the China-only cloud, 
And this makes things difficult because it makes things difficult to share knowledge and share, share information across borders. So we've got to work on it. It's a, it's a, a, a two-hour seminar in and of itself, but it's a race without a finish line. The bad guys are bad. They're getting worse all the time. Yes, sir? What have you learned from being a co-CEO? What have I learned from being a co-CEO? I think the first thing is trust is the ultimate human currency. So people say, like, how did you guys make it work? Well, we got this call in February 2010 that the former CEO um, was not, kind of voted off the board, okay? And I was, it was a Saturday morning. I was in Arizona with my family on the way to host a trip in Hawaii, and the call comes in. You know, what do you do? And the first thing you do is say, well, who's the, if you're offering me the job, and I'm the first call, that's cool, but who, who's the second call? Because I want to make sure I'm good with that before I say yes. And I was good with that because I had a high trust relationship with my co-CEO before the call was made. And therefore, if there was going to be a co, I couldn't have hoped for a better one. The other thing that we did is we really got rid of all that alpha male stuff early and basically said, the company needs us and the company needs a winning strategy. And at the time, it didn't have one. So let's dedicate everything to our higher purpose, which is making the company great again. And everything we did was focused on that strategy. And every move we made in that strategy, we did as a team. And the big breakthrough, I think, came when we had this meeting in Germany where we brought together 250 of the top leaders from all over the world. And this is a fascinating moment. You get up there, and you're basically role modeling the strategy of the company. And we're role playing, my co-CEO and I, and I must admit, we're okay. At the end of that, we then say, okay, now, here's the good part. All of you leaders, you get to do this. We need you now to go out in the coffee corners all across this company and tell the story in your own authentic voice, but on message with the strategy. Well, I'll tell you what happened. It was a fascinating learning. You learn just how uncomfortable managers are talking to people. They wanted no part of that. So what we did is we set them up in coffee corners in our biggest locations in Germany, and we went to every one of those coffee corners and watched them give the pitch to different audiences. Five here, ten there. By the time they left, let, they left. They knew what to do. And we started to march in a solid formation. And we never got off point. And the other thing is, you know, anything in life worth communicating is almost always under-communicated. So we over-communicated on every level. You know, to the company, to each other. And when we had a debate, and there were plenty of them, we did it in private. And ultimately, we didn't have a bias for who should win the argument. We just wanted the best idea to win. And all that really resulted in what I consider to be a tremendous friendship. And I think, you know, my slogan was, at the time, two is better than one. I'll have to come up with a new slogan now, but it was good and it, and it really did work. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, really, I really would like to. I mean, I think the, the health care opportunity is just unbelievable, and it's breathtaking in its nature. For example, there's a hospital in uh, Berlin called Charité Hospital, and we took this technology called SAP HANA, which is our platform for real-time computing, whether it's a transaction or it's unstructured information where you're capturing feedback, sentiment analysis off social sites. It does all of it at the speed of thought. And you don't have to rely on programmers having thought through all the best questions because you can ask the system any question you want and get an answer. Like we run the whole SAP company, 67,000 people, on iPads. And it's on one database. And of course that could be a large database and we work with EMC as our number one partner for the hardware and some of the very good software from VMware and the services, but that's it, that's, that's our major partnership. What we did is we took clinical trials 
that were completely unwieldy took days, if not months, to get the right clinical trial in the hands of the right patient. With the power of this technology, it's done in an instant. We also are looking at this whole genome research space and cancer treatment. What we did is we basically came up with a way to not just align the patient with the right surgeon, that's interesting, but most patients get wiped out in the post-op care, as you know. And most of them need a recommendation that's unique to their particular DNA. And the system isn't set up to do that now. But with this technology, and its ability to source information and look at data in real time and look at genome research and DNA data in real time, breakthroughs can be possible. I could also extend that into Washington, D.C. when you look at uh, Medicare and Medicaid with 40% fraud. Problem is with fraud, once you catch the fraud, the bad actor did the bad act. You don't have enough resources and money to track them down. So the real way to solve some of the problems is to track the fraud in the first place before it actually takes place. And we're working with um, the government and very, very serious people in the insurance industry to start getting in front of this with a database technology that fights tomorrow's wars, not yesterday's. And that's SAP HANA. That's our approach to it. Thank you. Yes. I'm intrigued by your focus on hiring millennials. Do you have any particular targets or goals with respect to gender and or racial or ethnic diversity in your company? Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is diversity and especially gender diversity is really huge. The problem is with this industry, we got to do a better job of sourcing people out of university so they know that there is a career track in companies like SAP. So I spent a lot of my personal time at universities that are diverse universities to get the message out there. There is not enough diversity in this industry, either on the gender or the racial side. And also, I think when you think about the global economy and global diversity, of all the things we could conquer, of all the things we could do to get better, that would be probably my number one idea. And yes, we do have targets for these things. But targets themselves aren't as good as leaders that are deeply committed to the mission and get with the young ones and explain to them, train them, on-ramp them. So we built now an SAP university. So the young ones can say, I might not know your industry, but I do respect your university, and I can learn, and I can onboard myself into your company. And sure, maybe I don't start you know, day one as vice president, but I'm willing to do the hard things so I can learn. So we created mentor programs and we bring them in so people have a chance to ride side by side with an experienced one so they're not left to their own devices where they could easily fail. And that's the big thing. You not only want to hire them, train them, but you got to retain them and make sure there's a system around them to protect them. We're doing all that. And it's still not enough. We still got to do more. It reminds me, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. I will take your question. Please. I was interested in your focus on reducing complexity. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, part of the answer is getting really good synthesized data to reduce complexity, but you've probably done some other things in your company to do that. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing, uh, we are looking at technologies that absorb less footprint. So, for example, this HANA technology actually reduces the drag on foot, hardware footprint by a very large margin. It also eliminates unnecessary code, so it kind of simplifies things. Today, for every $1 billion in revenue, most companies have 50 different applications. So that's a lot of code that we don't necessarily think is necessary. They have a lot of hardware that they forgot the reason why they bought it in the first place. And they have massive amounts of consultants. Today, 90 cents on every dollar serves hardware and services, and only 10 cents on the dollar serves innovation. If you can simplify the technology stack dramatically, you can bring that ratio to something like 60-40. And then you free up a lot of capital for innovation, new business models, new consumer paradigms, new growth objectives. So we do that through technology, and that's our big thing. 
And we do that through great partnerships like the one we have with Joe and EMC because together we can uh, actually achieve a lot more. So that's, you know, the, the big concept. But HANA is kind of at the heart of it. And it's not so much a product pitch. It's what we believe in. And then within our own company, I mean, we're a complex company too. Most companies are. And we're getting away from that. So, for example, I'll just give you the things we did. We said we're going to have one way of speaking to the customer. No matter what we do, there should be an account relationship plan that's very simple. We should have one support organization serving the customer. We should have one contract serving the customer. Not a hundred, not complex lawyers all over the place. We should have one digital relationship with a prospect when they come into the SAP website. In doing my own personal research on this, I found out that we had a thousand. I told the team that's at least 999 too much. And we're going to change that. So I think the first thing that you have to do is admit that you need help and give yourself a little truth serum. Look yourself in the mirror and say, we're too complicated. But then look at the customer relationship and how you can change the paradigm in their business by simplifying their landscape radically if you're in the tech industry and giving them a much different business outcome. Today, we all get briefing documents, right? You get the briefing documents. I don't want to hear anything about what SAP is trying to get. I want to hear everything about how what we do helps the customer get what they need to win the game. And if it doesn't speak in that language, we have no interest in the conversation. And that's what changes cultures. The other thing is you have to have real-time information. When I look at that iPad and I can see any relationship going on in the world in real time, if there's something that looks like crazy talk or it doesn't make sense, you make a phone call. Guess what? One phone call results in about a thousand others. They're really looking at this stuff. So it, it's, it's all about being real-time and being a real-time enterprise. Yes, sir? Uh, this is a personal question in that your Delhi story as a young man shows that your DNA is entrepreneurial. Now you're CEO of a, a massive, global, complex institution. How do you reconcile that? Well, I'd like to reconcile that with a story. Um, so, I, I, I mean, that's the best way I can explain it. When I was 21 years old, I didn't go into the delicatessen business so I could run a Subway uh, franchise. I went into the delicatessen business so I could put some money in my pocket, have a car, help my family, put myself through school, and get ready for the real game, which was to go into Manhattan with a suit and tie and win. And the first day I went to interview with Xerox Corporation, this is a fascinating thing. I mean, this is a kid from Amityville, Long Island, from delicatessen pedigree, <laughs> went to Dowling College Tuesdays and Thursdays because every other waking hour was in the delicatessen making money. Shows up in Manhattan at the top of the sixes. I walk in, all the kids from Westchester and Connecticut, all the suits straight out of Brooks Brothers, all the degrees, oh, where'd you go to school? Oh, I went to Dartmouth. Oh, cool, where'd you go to school? Oh, I went to Notre Dame, or I went to Boston College, or I went to... Oh, this is, this is gonna be a tough day. But, <laughs> but the, the, the main, this, this was the thing that broke through for me. That day I went on the train and I read the annual report about this guy named David Kearns who was the then CEO of Xerox Corporation, who was reinventing the company on a concept called total quality management. And I remember the passion in this guy's words and just the dynamism in what I think he was trying to do as a 21-year-old guy. So I bring all this to the hiring center, and I ask the kids, and I'm like, hey, what are you in for? And Karen, what are you in for? And they said, well, I'm kind of like, you know, interviewing with Xerox and you know, later I'm going to go to IBM. I got Merrill Lynch giving me calls, and, you know, there's always Goldman Sachs. And I'm like, okay. And that was a consistent theme. I knew exactly why I was there. And I knew, after surveying that room, my $99 suit from the mall <laughs> wasn't up to the standards of that Brooks Brothers, but I wanted it more, a lot more. So I go into my final interview after bouncing through the hiring center and then going to Xerox, and I sit down with Emerson Fullwood in the corner office in 9 West 57th on the 38th floor, and I'm looking out that window onto Central Park, and I thought to myself, Bill, this is your moment. 
<laughs> this is it, baby. You know, there's moments, and this one is it. So we get to the end, end of the interview, and, uh, you know, Mr. Fullwood looks at me, incredibly well-groomed gentleman, beautiful man. He said, um, I want to thank you very much, Bill. This was an exciting interview, and I really enjoyed it. And the HR department will get in touch with you in a couple of weeks. I said, uh, Mr. Fullwood, I don't think you completely understand the situation, sir. <laughs> And uh, kind of tilts his head at me a little bit. And I said, um, I haven't broken a promise to my father in 21 years. And I told my father when he dropped me off at the Long Island Railroad today, I promised him that I was coming home with my employee badge in my pocket. And I can't break a promise to my father. <laughs> so he kind of tilts his head again. And uh, I don't speak now. I wait for him. And he said, Bill McDermott. As long as you have not committed any crimes, you're hired. <laughs> and, and I said, well, I said, well, Mr. Bullard, I certainly haven't committed any crimes, but could you just please say that again? <laughs> you know, and then one of the funny stories that underscored it, you know, when I knew I was in the right place, is one day I'm on the streets of New York with uh, another gentleman, and I shall leave his name out of it for the time being, but he's got me carrying up copy machines and typewriters on my back, they call them memory writers, four flights of stairs on an August afternoon in a brownstone. So I get to the top floor of this brownstone, by now I could feel the sweat trickling down the side of my cheek, and then this is my other $99 suit, I had two of them. I charged them at the mall. And I get in the door, and I got this stuff on me, and all of a sudden, this cat comes flying off the book rack onto my chest. And I could just feel the nails going through my $99 suit. And it was also the skin, too, but I was more worried about the $99 suit, to be honest. And I looked at the woman coming from the back room, and I'm holding the cat, and I'm just petting the cat. And my partner, you know, who's taking me out, I'm the little trainee, right? He's like, his eyes are bulging, feeling like, there goes the sale. And I just pet the cat. And I said to the woman, Garfield has nothing on this cat. <laughs> so we started talking about cats and dogs and all this stuff. We had the greatest time. And this guy couldn't wait to plug in the machine and start demoing it. You know, I've got to show you the machine, see, by the machine. And we had such a good call and a, such a nice conversation. I just asked her, do you really need to see the machine? And she goes, oh, no. I said, one of each? Oh, yeah. <laughs> she goes, write it up, honey. And that was it. We get down to the street. This is a true story. We get down to the street now. Bob, uh, this gentleman said to me, Bill, I'm telling you right now, man, you're either going to be the CEO of Xerox or you're going to jail. <laughs> now, you, you can't, now, you cannot make this up. This is a true story. One of my steps along the way was I went to Puerto Rico to run Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands for Xerox, they get a phone call in the middle of the night. It was this gentleman who had been arrested in a sting operation in J.D.'s bar in Manhattan asking me to be a character witness. <laughs> it's been an amazing journey. So I just, I love business and I love people and I love big companies. So if you say, like, what makes you happy? Like, what's your thrill? It's like big groups of people and rooms like this just turn me on. And when you think about a big company, the reason I always thought it was better to be in a big company than a small company is I always valued the people and the excitement of the people more than taking a moonshot at a billion. Because I figured out a long time ago, I can only handle one steak at a time anyway, so I'm good. <laughs> it's not about the money. It's about doing what you love to do. And I love what I do. And I found that out when I was 21 and, and I never lost a passion. Yes, sir. Um, this is the fun street. Can you take a punch? Of course, sure. Um, having many years back in the early 90s, had Dick Egan sitting at my desk marketing to me, Steve Jobs marketing to me. This was at a major university around this town and another major university in Connecticut. And, um, and being told all the stuff that you've been saying about how you know, life's going to be better through greater efficiency. <clears throat> and then I looked at the industry, higher education, 
And in the institutions I knew, they were spending 20, 30, 40, 60, 80, 100 million dollars on your software and the competitors know it. And are we out of time? I think so. I, but I don't know. If you get to the punchline, I'm going <laughs> <laughs> uh, to. What was the punchline? The punchline is that the cost of higher education has continued to go through the ceiling yeah. and healthcare the same way. And um, it must be the people, right? No, I think one of the big things, you know, and, and this, this was one of the topics we covered actually at a CEO forum that uh, Joe and I did in New York City. I think that um, the fact is it's doubled uh, the cost of education. It's a lot for a lot of people. And there's a whole new wave of education that's going to come online. And I think the, the online education system is going to be an amazing equalizer to education as we know it today. Um, it's a long topic. It's a, it's a big debate. I know I have a couple of kids in school, and I feel very fortunate that I can afford to send them to school. And I would feel broken hearted to think that there was a kid with human potential that can't get there because it costs too much. It's very sad. So I, I agree with you. It's something we need to work on. Thank you all very, very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.